Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Meadows American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang. And we are almost to the blood. <laughs> Sometimes we come off on this show like we are rooting for um, kills and blood and um, all that stuff. But I mean, let's be honest. Nobody, uh, nobody watches movies about war and um, civil war and all that stuff if they weren't interested in looking at the um, killing and violent expect- expect- aspect of it. Um, with that being said, uh, we're on to end of November, or early December in the war, heading out of uh, 1861. We got four battles for you today, including two um, Confederate clashes with Native Americans up in Oklahoma, the first of such in um, the battles or the war so far. We got the uh, battles of Ivy Mountain, Round Mountain, Chusto Talasa, and Camp Allegheny. Um, those second two are pretty straightforward. Not a lot known about them. I guess nothing uh, was kept in in depth on those two. But Ivy Mountain and Camp Allegheny, decent sized ones. Camp uh, Battles of Ivy Mountain kind of starts out with uh, it's called the Big Sandy Expedition, which was an early campaign of the Civil War in Kentucky that began in mid September of 1861. When Union Brigadier General William Bull Nelson received orders to organize a new brigade at Maysville, Kentucky, and, and conduct an expedition into the Big Sandy Valley region of eastern Kentucky and stop the buildup of Confederate forces under Colonel John S. Williams. During the first week of September 1861, all pretense of neutrality in Kentucky ended, which we know, when Major General Leonidas Polk ordered Brigadier, Brigadier General Gideon Pillow advance Confederate troops up to Hickman, Kentucky. And then um, Kentucky's like, yeah, we ain't neutral no more. September 18th, 1861, Kentucky legislator approved the induction, introduction of federal troops from outside the state. The pro-Confederate legislators staying away. They're like, I don't want a part of this. Right. Like, you, whatever, man. The next day, Simon Bolivar Buckner, former commander of the Kentucky State Guard, established a Confederate headquarters at Bowling Green, Kentucky, while troops under Felix K. Zollicoffer seized Barberville. Mm Mm-hmm. Which you can go back and look at that battle. Shortly afterwards, Zollicoffer arrived at Cumberland Ford with approximately 3,200 men, consisting of four infantry regiments and field battery of six guns Mm. and four cavalry companies. So we got some cavalry, got some horses. Obviously, horses. Obviously, this posed an, an imminent threat to the Union control of central Kentucky at a time when increasing numbers of Confederates into the big sandy valley of eastern Kentucky appeared about appeared about to enter the bluegrass region through McCormick's Gap, which is in Frenchburg. Mm. In response, Brigadier General George H. Thomas ordered troops from Camp, camp Dick Robinson. Why do they name these camps stuff like this? Right. To southeast Camp... Why can't it just be Camp Robinson? Right. Uh, to southeast Kentucky to halt any movement toward Big Hill, Richmond, and Lexington. Former Vice President of the United States John C. Breckinridge and his ally, Colonel Humphrey Marshall, added to Thomas's concerns with a call for peacemen and states' rightsmen to assemble in Lexington for drill. However, However, both Breckenridge and Marshall instead rode to Mar- Mount Sterling to join the Confederate forces in Western Virginia, where Marshall took command of the Army of Eastern Kentucky, posted at Piketon, which okay. is now called Pikeville, Pikeville, I believe. Okay, here. So they want Kentucky. They want Kentucky. They want it, and they both want Both sides now. are like, we need to protect. Well, the uh, Federals are, and then the Confederates are like, we need to get. Right. <laughs> Several days later... Bull Nelson publicly announced he had established his headquarters at Camp Canton near Washington, Kentucky, and would arm and equip volunteers to end treason in Mm. Kentucky. The Philadelphia Press wrote that the Big Sandy Expedition would prevent the Confederates from taking control of the mouth of the Big Sandy River, where it entered the Ohio River. Oh, that's a big spot there. This would protect the river. River, no, it would protect the rear (laughs) and right flank of Brigadier General William S. Rosencrantz in Western Virginia allowing Nelson to reinforce Wildcat Mountain and to push Dolly Coffer back to Knoxville. This is a very, very, very important little uh, um, little piece right here. Speaking of the news, you got the news writing about like the battles and what 
what the strategies are. Just imagine if we had a civil war today, what the news would be like. Holy shit, dude. There'd never be any battles. <laughs> <laughs> it would just be a battle of both sides of the news. Right. <laughs> they'd be just winning the war. They'd be, they'd be punching each other and shit at the <laughs> sites. And, oh, man. I didn't even want to think about it. Holy right. Shit. Nelson the Democrats made, would be the Confederates, right? Uh, yes, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to all you Democrats out there, but it's clear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nelson made Olympia or Olympian Spring which is now known as Mud Lick Springs in Bath County, the staging area. He named it Camp Gill in honor of Harrison Gill, owner of the renowned spa eight miles south of Owensville and 20 miles east of Mount Sterling. He's a spa owner and he gets a whole damn thing named after him. The Mount Sterling Pound Gap Road, Route 460, ran through McCormick's Gap in Frenchburg. The gateway to... He owned a legit natural spa. Oh, he owned that land that it was on. He owned a, a renowned spa eight miles south of Owensville and 20 miles east of Mount Sterling. Right. Didn't they only have, like, hot springs? They weren't mm. in, they weren't a spa. I mean, it depends on what they did. Depends on what they did. Right. Put leaves over your eyes or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> Massaged you or something. Would that be a spa? I guess. I don't know what a spa is. I've never been to a spa. Have you? No. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Sterling Pound Gap Road, which is Route 60, ran through McCormick's Gap in Frenchburg, the gateway to bluegrass region from Prestonsburg. On September 29, 1861, Major John Smith Hurt occupied the Vital Mountain Pass with three militia companies. Hmm. Colonel Lewis Braxton Grigsby added his 300 men to Hurt's 200 on October 8th. Colonel James Perry Fife had the 59th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment march to Camp Canton. And Colonel Leonard A. Harris arrived in Olympian Springs with the 2nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Jeez. Colonel Jesse S. Norton came forward from Nicholasville with the 21st Ohio. And during the next two weeks, Nelson's forces grew to about 55 hundo, 37 of them from Ohio, 3,700 from Ohio, 1,800 from Kentucky. Oh, jeez, they don't even got Kentuckians fighting for their own Kentucky. Yeah, Ohioans. It's close enough. All right. At a farm near Prestonburg, Confederate captains Andrew Jackson May and John Finklin, Ficklin assisted So, who was John S. Williams with the organization of the 5th Kentucky Infantry. Who the hell is Cyril Gordo? Uh, what does Cyril Gordo mean? There's a lot of names and a lot of um, things going on here. <laughs> right. So all these are, so the first part were union. All union. So about 5,500 of those. And only about a, a little over a thousand for the southern. Maybe the one thousand and ten man unit was badly clothed. Some called the hard nosed group the Ragamuffin Regiment. Ragamuffin. Uh, the nine companies of the infantry and five mountain companies had two pieces of artillery, and they carried an assortment of personal weapons that were ill suited for warfare. Oh, of course, they were. On Monday, October twenty first, eighteen sixty one, troops that Nelson had assembled. At Camp Dick Robinson became engaged in a protracted fight with Zollicoffer's Confederates along the Wilderness Road at Wildcat Mountain, we know this. which we covered. The next morning, Nelson was unaware of, the, of this when he ordered 1,600 men under Colonel L Leonard Harris to advance 35 miles to West Liberty with two artillery pieces. Uh, that Wednesday, Nelson was in front of Hazel Green with about 3,500 men in artillery. 38 of the 200 Confederates surrendered after a brief fight. 12 miles north at West Liberty... 500 700 Confederates suffered a loss of 21 dead, 40 wounded, and 34 captured. The federal loss was two wounded. <laughs> well, while Nelson waited for his wagon trains to catch up, he consolidated his forces at Licking Station, which is Sailorsville. The operation resumed on October 31st, and on reaching Prestonburg, they found the supposed Gibraltar of eastern Kentucky abandoned. They abandoned and did it. Going to the Battle of Ivy Mountain, we got the obviously the Union commander William Bull Nelson with a force of 36 hundo. And for this battle, the uh, Confederacy led by John S. Williams has a force of 400. Oh, jeez. That's just not even fair. Mm, Thursday, November 7th, Colonel Joshua W. Sill started the northern prong of the Big Sandy expedition towards Johns Creek. From there, he was to veer south for about 40 miles and gain the rear of the enemy at Pikeville. The following morning, Nelson took the main column of 3,600 men toward Pikeville on the Old State Road, which is Route 460. Heavy rain fell in, tor tor in Torrents, torrential rain, rain right. as they neared Ivy Mountain, which was a hogback, 1,000-foot hill about half a mile long. 
The West Laviza Fork of the Big Sandy River restricted movement on the right side of the seven-foot path, and knee-deep mud forced the artillery to unlimber their guns and rig them so they could follow the infantry forward in single file. Yeah, because there ain't no way they were pushing that shit through that mud, dude. That's rough. Talk about being sitting ducks. Yeah, ain't kidding. About 15 miles west of Pikeville, the advance guard disappeared into the elbow of the path as it turned down toward the crossing at Ivy Creek. Directly to the front, there were 250 Confederates some 100 feet away up the hill and hidden behind rocks, trees, and bushes. About 1 p.m., that hillside exploded with blue smoke from the double barrel shotguns and old muskets carried by the Confederates. In the next instant, four Union soldiers were dead. Another 13 lay on the ground wounded. Nelson rushed forward with They're his... like, surprise! Right. Nelson rushed forward with his saber drawn. He climbed up on a conspicuous, conspicuous, conspicuously located rock and told his men that if the rebels could not hit him, they could not hit any of them. And then he fell dead. <laughs> conspicuous, too. Not like they couldn't see him. Right. Because it wasn't inconspicuous, you know. <laughs> All right. He ordered, he ordered the 2nd Ohio Infantry and the 21st Ohio Infantry to push up the side of the mountain and flank the enemy position from the north. At the same time, Nelson had two light artillery pieces take a position near the mouth of Ivy Creek and West Laviza Fork and fired directly into the enemy breastworks. About 2.20 p.m., the 21st Ohio Infantry arrived at the top of the hill. They rode large boulders down on the Confederates who ran off mm. in every direction. <laughs> A half hour later, Captain May had his men felling trees and burning bridges to retard pursuit. Okay. The Battle of Ivy Mountain, or Ivy Narrows, wherever you want to say, it was a clear victory for the Union force of course. under Nelson, who had gained full control of the field at a loss of six killed and 24 wounded. Of course it was a clear victory. They had, they had <laughs> 80 times the men that they had. 180 times the men. The opposing Confederates had Ted wounded. Ted. Ted was. <laughs> Damn, Ted. Ted. Ted was wounded. Ted, Ted dead. <laughs> Ted dead. The opposing Confederates had 10 dead, 15 wounded, and 50 missing or taken prisoner. Mm. Nelson ended the pursuit beyond a burned bridge at Coldwater Creek and near the home of Unionist Lindsey Lane. Williams continued on to Bikeville, where he posted a rear guard of 400 men to cover a withdrawal to Pound Gap with the remainder of his force. 3 a.m., Saturday, 9th of November. Nelson had his troops back in pursuit. Terrible road conditions retarded movement, and by nightfall, he remained five miles from Pikeville. Early Sunday, 10th of November, Nelson had come to within several miles of the objective when a detachment from Joshua Sills' northern prong rode forward to advise they had secured the town at 4 p.m. Saturday. Mm, well, good for them. All right. In Pound Gap, Colonel Williams reported that Nelson had dispersed an unorganized and half-armed barefooted squad oh. that lacked everything but the will to fight. Yeah. Uh, the Cincinnati Commercial noted that Nelson had shown how troops could be moved across against uh, across unforgiven terrain without adequate transportation. That determination had truly surprised Williams, who believed in, that Nelson would continue into Virginia with the intent of destroying the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, uh -oh. which was a line that connected the Confederate capital at Richmond with uh, the Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, and the Mississippi Valley at Knoxville. Ooh, they're going so, big there, huh? Well, that's what uh, Williams believed he was going to do. Right. In the first accounts of the fighting at Ivy Mountain, northern... Northern news correspondents grossly misrepresented events because their northern audience wanted a quick conclusion to the war, which wasn't going to happen. Everybody wanted a quick conclusion to the war. Well, it's been about eight months, nine months now. I don't think there's anything right. quick about it. And there's another three years. Those mistakes led the Cincinnati Gazette to conclude that while a great victory had been attained, the campaign in eastern Kentucky has no more permanent effect than the passage of a showman's caravan. 500 rebel guerrilla cavalry will undo in a week the ornamental work done at so great an expenditure of money and most precious time. The latter issues were of great concern. And the reason why Brigadier General Don Carlos Buell, whoever that guy is, replaced Brigadier General William T. Sherman in Louisville. Nelson received orders to report there and his brigade followed on Sunday afternoon, November 24th, as predicted the Confederates returned and that brought Colonel James A. Garfield into the region to resume the unfinished task of subduing them. Is that the James A. Garfield? I don't think so. I think it is. He was president after. I don't know. Right? I don't think so. Maybe. He was a colonel in the war? I don't think so. Garfield? Every, every president was. Sure was. Look at that. 20th president of the United States. Good for him. Uh, the, that brings us to the Battle of Round Mountain, which takes place... Uh, 
on the tr- uh, it's the first battle in the Trail of Blood on Ice campaign for the control of Ind- Indian territory during the Civil War occurred on March night or March November nineteenth, eighteen sixty one. Its main purpose was to prevent Union supporters of the Creek Nation, led by Apothlaahola, from fleeing Indian territory to the protection of Union forces in Kansas. So they didn't want these guys to go uh, <clears throat> flee into the protection. Right. We got the Confederates. Uh, called Cooper's Brigade, brigade led by Colonel Douglas H. Cooper. Makes sense. Had six companies, 1st Regiment, Choctaw, Chickasaw Mounted Rifles. So hmm. they got some uh, Indians with them as well, huh? Uh, led by Major Mitchell LaFleur. We have a detachment from the 1st Creek Mounted Rifles, Colonel Daniel N. McIntosh with them. Detachment, 2nd uh, Creek Mounted Rifles, Lieutenant Colonel Chili McIntosh. Must be brothers. Hmm. Detachment of Seminole Indians led by Major John Jumper. Detachment of 9th Texas Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel William Quayle. For the Union, all Indians, no Union forces. Creek and Seminole Indians, led by Apatha La Jolla. The Lacapoca Creeks, the Muscogee Creeks, and the Seminoles, which were led by, um, what do they call their guys? Warrior, warrior guy, Halleck Tustanugi, and Sonic Miko. Hmm. Sonic Miko. I don't like Indian names. I <laughs> know. <laughs> Get them all wrong. Colonel Douglas H. Cooper, Confederate commander of the Indian Department, was unable to reconcile differences with Apalapaleahula. <laughs> Apalapaleahula. 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 Commander of the Band of Unionist Creeks and Seminoles. Apalapaleahula. Group Seminoles was, were in Oklahoma, though? Wow. Everywhere. Group was estimated to number about 1,700. Wow. wow. And also concluded some Union supporters from Comanches, Delawares, Kickapoos, Wichitas, and Shawnees. Cooper set out on November 15th, 1861, with about 1,400 men, either to compel Atapalaihoa's submission or drive him and his party from the country. Damn, from the country. Either you guys with us or you against us. Mm-hmm. You want to go to jail or you want to go home? Mm. <laughs> Window or stairs. Cooper's force rode up the deep fork of the Canadian River to find Apatalaeahola's camp deserted. On November 19th, Cooper learned from the captured prisoners that part of Apatalaeahola... Why do they have to keep on saying this guy's name? <laughs> Apatalaeahola's band was erecting a fork at the Red Fork of the Arkansas Fork. <laughs> <laughs> it's a re- that's, that's actually known as the world's biggest fork now. <laughs> this fork was arrest, erected by Apatalaeahola. <laughs> 1861. Oh, my goodness. I'm just glad it's not a song. <laughs> Cooper's men arrived there around 4 p.m. Charging Calvary discovered that Apatalaeahola's followers had recently abandoned their camp. Yes, we just... Again, they did? The Confederates located and followed stragglers. The 4th Texas blundered into Apatalaeahola's warriors on the tree line at the foot of the Round Mountains. The Federal response chased the Confederate cavalry back to Cooper's main force. Hmm. Darkness prevented Cooper's counterattack until the main enemy force was was within 60 yards. After a short fight, Apatalaeahoya's men sent, set fire to the prairie grass oh. and retreated. Of course they did. The following morning, Cooper advanced on Apatalaeahoya's canoe camp, but found that the Federal forces had fled. The Confederates claimed victory because Apatalaeahoya had left the area. The Confederates captured abandoned supplies such as uh, their carriage and a dozen wagons, food, cattle, and ponies. Mm. The Confederates' loss in the engagement was one captain and five men killed. Oh, a captain, though. Three severely and one slightly wounded and one missing. Uh, Pataleahola lost 110, Jeez. which was killed and wounded. This was the first of three encounters between Pataleahola Union Band and Confederate troops. The Unionists were forced to flee to Kansas after the Battle of Chasanahala at the end of the year. <laughs> We'll be having that coming up probably next episode, maybe. Um, there's a little bit of controversy with this battle site, as the site of this event has been disputed for many years, Uh-oh. with two locations emerging as the leading choices. No. One is near the present-day town of Yale, Oklahoma. The other is close to the former site of Keystone, which is now submerged by the waters of Keystone Lake. Angie Debo, a noted Oklahoma historian, wrote an article describing the evidence for and against each site. She concluded that the evidence pointed more strongly to the Yale site. Hmm. Which, if I'm not mistaken, that's where they hold all of the uh, reenactments and right. everything. Which, obviously, right. you're not going to do it at the Keystone site because no. it's underwater. Right. I think they just did that because it's underwater. Yeah. And they're like, well, who's going to prove us wrong? Right. 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 
the Battle of Chusto Tallahassee. Tallahassee? Tallahassee? Also known as Bird Creek, Caven Banks, and High Shoal, was fought December 9th, 1861, in what is now Tulsa County, Oklahoma, then Indian Territory back in that day. During the American, of course, it was during the American Civil War. <laughs> It was the second of three battles in the Trail of Blood on Ice campaign for the control of Indian Territory during the Civil War. Right. Cooper's Brigade, once again, had six companies. First, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Mountain Rifles, Major Mitchell LaFleur again. So, all, oh, no, he got different detachments now. Uh, detachment, Choctaw Battalion, Captain Alfred Wade. <laughs> Choctaw, man. Detachment, First Creek Regiment, Colonel Daniel McIntosh. Detachment, Creek Indians, Captain James M.C. Smith. 1st Cherokee Mountain Rifle Regiment, Colonel John Drew. 4th Texas Cavalry Regiment, Colonel William B. Sims. Detachment 9th Texas Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel William Quayle. Whitfield's Battalion was Captain John Whitfield. Mm -hmm. Look at the Confederates coming up, and the Union guy's only getting a little. And once again, we have Chief Opathalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahalahal
perhaps thinking the Confederate morale was low, a Union brigade of 2,000 men under Brigadier General Robert H. Milroy attacked Johnson and his 1,200 Confederates at sunrise on Uh-oh. December 13th. It's almost an even fight. And then obviously we have uh, Robert Milroy with the Union and a couple brigades for him, and then um, Confederacy side, Edward Johnson with a couple of his brigades. So. All right. When Milroy's advance and a Confederate scouting party had skirmished on the 12th of December, the next morning, Milroy divided his troops into a two-pronged attack to flank the Confederate camp. The first column advanced up the Staunton Parkersburg Pike, engaging the Confederate right side for several hours before withdrawing. Because of the difficult mountain terrain, the, union, the second Union column arrived shortly after withdrawal of the first column. Therefore, unable to support the main body of Union troops on the right as planned. Mm. But then attacked the Confederate left. All right, well, when the left column of the Union forces arrived, an officer believed that they were his own pickets returning, ordered his men not to fire, and rode forth to bring them into camp. Oh, you dumb. Uh, the Confederate officer was killed by a shot from Union troops, and the second part of the battle commenced with fierce fighting. Yeah. Idiots. After the right Union column had withdrawn, Johnson ordered all his troops who had been fighting there to join the battle on the left flank, and the concentrating Confederate fire broke up the left Union assault, and the final Union troops withdrew. <laughs> I mean, it was just too much of a terrain, right? He, he, yeah, not, neither of them can do pretty right. much. In a piercing winter wind, fighting had raged for much of the sunlit morning as each side maneuvered on the hillside, hillside slopes, fields, and woods to gain the advantage. On the right flank, Milroy's force found a position in a mountain clearing among the fallen timber, stumps, and brush, which proved to be too difficult for Confederate infantry to dislodge, yeah, obviously. Bet. A Confederate artillery battery unlimbered and unleashed a storm of round shot and canister among them, knocking their timber defenses about their heads and making their nests too hot to hold them. Yeah. yeah. You pretty much sit ducks, anything out there, you fall in trees or the hell out of there, right? Done. The fighting on the right moved back and forth from advance to retreat with the Union temporarily occupying the post only to be driven off. Right. The Confederates attempted their own flanking maneuvers, which quickly failed because their force was too thin. Yeah. The fighting was in such close quarters that the Confederate cannons and the fortification could not be used. Nope. It would just fly right over everybody. Yeah. Uh, after fighting for seven for over seven hours without taking the position, Milroy's troops withdrew, retreating to his camps at Green Spring Run near Cheat Mountain. Johnson claimed the Confederate losses were 20 men killed, 96 wounded, and 28 missing. I mean, that 96 wounded is a big number. According to one Confederate soldier in 52nd Virginia Infantry... I had a splendid position in this battle. Could see the whole fight without having to take any part in it. <laughs> and I remember how I thought Colonel Johnson must be the most wonderful hero in the world. As I saw him at one point where his men were hard pressed, snatch a musket in one hand and swinging a big club in the other. He led his line right up among the enemy, driving them headlong down the mountain, killing and wounding many with the bayonet and capturing a large number of prisoners. Confederate units under Johnson's command during the battle were the 12th Georgia Regiment, the 52nd Virginia, 31st Virginia, a detachment of Pittsylvania. Oh, Pittsylvania. Poor guys. <laughs> uh, Pittsylvania Cavalry, which fought dismounted with carbines, and the Lee Battery of Virginia light artillery consisting of four pieces. Mm, okay. Okay, okay, okay. The battle, though considered insignificant p- compared to later battles in the Civil War, which I think that's all of 1861 as a whole, right. was actually one of the bloodiest in the initial year of the war. Yep. From April to December, obviously, of this year, the Union casualties are estimated 137, hmm. Confederate casualties at 147. Okay. Johnson would receive the nickname Allegheny Johnson for his role at the battle for and for commanding the Forbidden Mountain Post. Right. That's rough battling there, man. Ironically, the Confederates had received orders to withdraw a few days prior to the battle. What? Hmm. So they can, there, was no re- there, yeah. <laughs> there was no reason to even fight this battle. But the failed Union assault convinced the Confederate higher command to reinforce Johnson's force right. and, and place at Camp Allegheny with five regiments through the remainder of the harsh winter of 1861 through the uh, beginning of 1862. The weather was bitter snow, was often knee-deep, something the southern soldiers, mainly from Georgia and Virginia, were not right. accustomed to. The toll on Confederate troops was brutal. On March 18th, 1862, prior to the subsequent Battle of McDowell in Highland County, which was on May 8, 1862, Johnson, by then promoted to general, had roughly 4,000 men stationed at Camp Allegheny in Pocahontas County, but his effective strength was only 12,784 as nearly 1,200 men were sick 
or unavailable. <laughs> okay. So uh, they built it up, but a lot of them are like, I'm too sick. Right. I'm unavailable. Uh, after the Battle of Camp Allegheny, Johnson also knew that the post was vulnerable to being flanked. Right. And believed that Shenandoah Mountain, 40 miles to the southeast, was a better position to defend the Staunton to uh, Parkersburg Pike and the approaches to the Shenandoah Valley. Combined with the loss of men in the harsh mountain winter and the logistical challenges of keeping the remote mountain post effectively supplied, General Robert E. Lee agreed to let Johnson abandon the post in favor of Shenandoah Mountain on April 2nd, 1862. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, if you're not going to be successful there, why stay? I mean, the mountainous. Ooh. Yeah, you, that's why West Virginia succeeded for the Union. Rough. By April 6, 1862, Johnson's constructed Fort Edward Johnson at the site on Shenandoah Mountain, just 26 miles west of Staunton. However, the new fortification was soon abandoned on April 19th. When Johnson left to rendezvous with the Confederate Army of General Thomas Stonewall Jackson mm. in advance of the Battle of McDowell. The battles in the rugged and mountainous region of West Virginia were small by later standards, but left an enduring footprint because these counties that were in the unit control formed the nucleus of the new state. Of West Virginia. What I literally just said. Right. Because of the Battle of Camp Allegheny and the subsequent Battle of McDowell, the future state line between Virginia and West Virginia would begin and stop at the Pocahontas and Highland County line, even though the counties shared the same geographic, geographic traits and mountain culture. All right. It doesn't matter. Right. Uh, neither Pocahontas County nor Highland County participated in the creation of West Virginia, but Pocahontas was included in the new state nevertheless as part of the Congressional Statehood Bill when Highland remained part of Virginia. Oh. In 1903, Ambrose Bierce wrote a column in the New York American about the visiting about visiting the battle site entitled A Bavuic of the Dead, uh -oh. recalling his involvement in the battle as a member of a Union regiment. Bierce wrote movingly about the sacrifice and suffering of the men in this little-remembered battle in a remote area and hauntingly about how little the battlefield had changed. Dude, right, I'm, there's nothing there. It's probably, right. It probably looks exactly the same. Here, dude, if you don't understand what West Virginia, the mountainous areas of West Virginia is, and man, it's rough. Mm -hmm. That's why they call them mountain people, those mountain guys in West Virginia. What, what was the, what's the uh, little mountain range there? Appalachians. Yeah, there's another one. Uh, it's the Appalachians, but it's the uh, Allegheny Mountains, too, which are part of the Appalachians. Right, and then you got the... Uh, Smoky Mountains. You got all that shit yeah, down there. Yeah, yeah. Or the... Uh, right, 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 right. Isn't right. there like the Blue Mountains, too, or something? I don't know. It's all part of the Appalachian chain, though. Ozarks and all that. Matter of fact, the Allegheny Mountains are part of the border of West Virginia and Virginia. Just the mountain line. One side is West Virginia, one side's uh, Virginia. All right. Well, this battle is also known as the Battle of Allegheny Camp or the Battle of Allegheny Mountain. Johnson was actually referred to in the South as Allegheny Johnson. Right. Reflecting the usage that d derives from the English co uh, colonial area rather than the French derivative, Allegheny. <laughs> okay. Contemporary accounts from the time in the South used the word Allegheny, including Johnson's own accounts of the battle published in Staunton Spectator in all March spelled different with right. with an A-N-Y instead of E-N-Y. Right. The Camp Allegheny Historic District is a national historic district encompassing one contributing structure and four contributing sites. They are the earthworks, site of hut and campground, cemetery, church site, and the site of the Jaeger Farmstead. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1990. There we go. Yes, sir. That's uh, our four battles. But something we should have been doing um, throughout this whole thing is um, other notable moments kind of uh, during the battles that we're covering for this episode. So obviously our timeline, uh, this episode is November 8th through December 13th. So just critical moments in the war that uh, aren't talked about for the battles. But November 8th, 1861, USS San Jacinto captures the British mail steamer Trent en route from Havana to Europe aboard, a pair, aboard are a pair of Confederate commissioners, James Mason and oh. John Slidell. Look at those sneaky, sneaky. Mm -hmm. What the hell are they going there for? Anyways. Right. Three days later, November 11th, 1861, in Union ship GW Park Curtis releases an observation balloon to spy on Confederate positions off the Potomac River. All right. All right. Gather an intel. November 12th, 1861, a Scottish-built merchant ship, the Fingal, acquired in England by Confederate agents, successfully runs the Union blockade at Savannah to to deliver much-needed supplies. Oh, shit. So, it's wow. getting in some supplies there. And they ran around the Union blockade. How the hell that happened? November 18th, 1861, at Russellville, Kentucky, some authorities gather to vote for independence. George Johnson is named as new governor. 
Okay. Same day, 1861, the Confederate Provisional Congress meets once more in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, Confederate Provisional Congress. November 19th, 1861, to better meet the need for resupply and reinforcements, Confederate President Jefferson Davis implores the Congress to fund the construction of an east-west railway system. Yeah, you guys need some railroads down there, right. guys. That same day as well, November 19th, Julia Ward Howe pens the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The poem is written to the song John Brown's Body. John Brown, the battle hymn of the Republic. Right? Yep. November 22nd, 1861. Indian territories of the South are now under Confederate rule. Yeah, of course they would be. Right. November 25th. Judah Benjamin, the Confederate Secretary of War, calls on all East Tennessee traders to be executed Whoa. where they stand. Oh, that's a little bit. Yeah, much yes. there, guy. Jeez, Come on, John or Judah. Jeez, Tennessee. What are you doing? Right. What are you doing in Tennessee? Wow. Well, this is the Confederate Secretary of War for the whole damn Confederacy too. Right. So, my yeah. only Tennesseans. December first, eighteen sixty-one. By this time, Union infantry numbers in Kentucky swell to seventy thousand men. Okay. Next day, December twenty or second. The next meeting of the United States Congress, President Lincoln calls for a new railroad to be constructed to help in the Union War effort. So he's like, we need more. December 2nd, 1861, Union fighting strength numbers from 661,000 men by this date. They're going to need a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah. That's going to do it. Everything that uh, happened from the dates we covered today, that was the battles of Battle of Ivy Mountain in Kentucky, a Union win, Battle of Round Mountain in Oklahoma, a Confederate win. Against the Indians, the Battle of Chusto Talasa, also Oklahoma against the Indians, Confederate win, and the camp, Battle of Camp Allegheny, which um, yeah. Class C battle inconclusive. inconclusive. But so, all right. we got uh, six more battles to end out 1861. We'll probably do uh, three next week, and then three the week after. We got the Battle of Rowlett Station, Class D battle, the skirmish at Blackwater Creek. Battle of Drainsville, Class C battle, Battle of Chustanala, the last one of the Blood on Ice campaign, the Battle of Mount Zion Church, Uh-oh. which is a D battle, and uh, ending out on December 28th, Sacramento, Kentucky, the Battle of. So, hmm. yeah, and then it's like, hmm. these guys are taking a couple days off from major like right. battles and stuff like this, but 1862 is every day. Mm. Mm, they battle every day. <laughs> mm, I battle every day. I battle every day. It's going to do it for us. Battles of the American Civil War. This episode, if you guys are uh, history buffs and you like true crime type of stuff, we do another podcast called uh, Outlaws and Gunslingers where we covered everything from the Wild West, Prohibition, gangs, um, the Unabomber, Jonestown, the other bombing, uh, Oklahoma City bombing. We just wrapped up 1992 LA riots and... Um, our last episode was all about was the it? Isabella Gardner oh, yeah, Museum. Yeah, the Gardner heist. Museum art heist, the largest art heist in American history, worth up to about $600 million of stolen items that have never been found. So you guys can go check that out, Outlaws and Gunslingers, on the Creative Control Network. Just search either Creative Control Network, you'll find us, or Outlaws and Gunslingers, you'll find us. And we'll be back next week for another episode of Battles of the American Civil War. We are the Mouth of Michiganders with Bang Dang.